teachers for the equipment of the state for the work of the ministry. And that each and every one of us were here. And the reason that we go to church is to be equipped to do the work of the ministry. Uh, the reason we come to church is to be equipped to, to proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world. The reason we come to church is to be equipped to lay hands on the set. The reason we come to church is to be equipped to cast out devils. Amen. That's what the scripture said this morning that we were looking at and that we read. Those signs will follow those that believe. And so that's something that is supposed to be a manifestation in the lives of believers. And we looked at how God poured out his Holy Spirit upon his sons and his daughters, upon his handmaids, upon his servants, upon the young men, old men. They would dream dreams, have visions, prophesy. And, and that wasn't just prophets, but that was God's children. That was his sons and his daughters, handmaids and servants, young and old. And so if he's poured out his spirit upon all of us, then we have to understand why did he pour out his spirit upon all of us. It's why, so we would be witnesses, did Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So what each and every person is here for is to be equipped for ministry. So tonight you're in ministry school. And that's really what church is supposed to be. That's supposed to be the purpose of what we're here for, is to be equipped to go out there and to work for God and do the works of the ministry. And so when... One of the things we've got to understand is we want to look tonight, if you want to go to Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm going to be in Ephesians a little bit tonight, that's not necessarily the point I'm bringing out, but we're going to be Ephesians for just a moment, Ephesians chapter 3, hallelujah, Ephesians chapter 3, I went backwards, and uh, one of the things that you find in, in ministry uh, most of you know I spent about 10 years of my life at Faith, Hope, and Love and basically ministering in a prison ministry. A lot of people come and go in that ministry. A lot of people come and go really fast in that ministry. A lot of people last a couple days. I mean, there's just a lot of, a lot of people coming and going in that ministry. And you get a lot of people who come in and, and, you know, they think it really sounds neat to go into prison ministry. Sounds really charming. That would really be a neat thing to do. That would be awesome to do. And they have no idea of the battle that it involves. And so they come in, and they don't realize that they have just stepped right into the pit of hell. And they're going to do spiritual battle like you've never done before in your life. And so they, th but they think it's going to be charming. And they come in, and the next thing you know, they're saying, well, oh, I'm just, you know, just burnt out, and, and they can't do it anymore. Now, that happened a whole lot in that ministry. When I left that ministry, I was there within my 10th year, and I was there longer than anybody else in that ministry. I was the old man after 10 years in the ministry. By a lot. By a lot. Most people don't last but a few months, uh, if that long. Uh, it just tears them up. You see that as a pastor a lot, not quite to that extreme, but a lot of times people will come to you as a pastor and think, you know, the Lord really put on my heart to do this. The Lord's really put on my heart that I should go out and, and, and do this type of ministry or be involved doing this type of ministry in the church. And they're all excited about it, but they do it for a little bit, and the next thing you know, they're, just, they're, they're, they're done. They don't want to do it no more. What is the problem in those cases? You see, the problem in most cases in ministry is, is, a, bad, is a problem with motivation. Their motivation is not right. You see, before we do anything for the Lord, our motivation has to be right. And probably I would say one of the things I've seen most in ministry over the years is people's motivation not being right. There's only one motivation that is the right motivation in ministry. And anything else is 100% wrong in the eyes of God. Now, that seems like kind of a harsh thing, but a lot of people in ministry, they have various motivations. You know, they, they see it and they get excited about it and they think, boy, like I said, like prison ministry, it, it sounds really charming. They think they're going to go in and, and you know, the, the prisoners are going to just welcome them with open arms, and a lot of times they do. Uh, you know, they go into the halfway house ministry like I was in and, and think, boy, there are people who are going to come in here and you're just, it's just going to be this big love fest, and they're just going to go out and serve God, and everything's going to be wonderful, and then they smoke right around you. And everything changes. Then they go out and they get high and break into the ministry wrong place. Yeah. Everything changes. They, if this 
person that you've been ministering to and, and sharing with and pouring your life into goes out and find out, you know, two months later they were a mass murderer now. <coughs> Everything changes. In other words, not realizing the power of hell and what a person is stepping into. You see, that's not something you do just because you want a good feeling. That's not something you do because you want status. We all have those desires in us. But there's only one possible motivation for ministry, and if that's not there in the eyes of God, we're disqualified. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm just going to kind of bounce around a little bit tonight and look at several different things. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19. And if you remember right, we've been going through the book of Ephesians, we've looked at two prayers that Paul prayed. Paul prayed in, in Ephesians chapter 1 that they would understand the power and authority that was unleashed when Christ was exalted and placed on the right hand of the Father. And to understand that that authority had been restored to the body of Christ. And so that's important to understand that. But in Ephesians chapter 3 we find out that Paul is again praying for the church at Ephesus. And he's praying for the church at Ephesus that they would have another kind of experience. And that experience would be the love of God. And so Paul, as I said this morning is a man of prayer, praying for that church. That's a key thing. We looked at several elements that had to be in a church to be a church that's going to develop people who are going to walk in the maturity of Christ. It has to be a church that has a fivefold ministry. It has to be a church that's a praying church. It has to be a church that is teaching the Word of God, so on and so forth. And so we see here that Paul is praying for the church at Ephesus, and he's praying here at this point in time that they would have an experience of the greatness of God's love for them. You see, that's the number one thing we've got to understand. When you look at a lot of ministries, sometimes if we don't understand the love of God, the ministries won't make any sense. You know, you look back at William Booth when he started the Salvation Army. His ministry don't make any sense. Why this man would want to go out into the streets and minister to the poor and, and, and suffer all the consequences and the ridicule he did doesn't make any sense in the worldly sense. I mean, he could have went and he could have had offered big churches and he could have been a big deal and had all the status and it been a big deal. But something compelled him to go into the streets and the highways and hedges and minister to broken people. Something in his heart compelled him to do that. In our modern time, we see Heidi Baker who went to Mozambique, which at that time was the poorest nation in the world, and she went there and began to minister to orphans. Why would anybody do that? I mean, that doesn't sound that charming, does it? I mean, do you want to go live in the streets of Mozambique and have, and, and, and have no status and minister to orphans? Most of us don't jump up and down and say, praise God, count me in, Pastor. That's not a ministry that people have a lot of work on. Why would somebody do that? And yes, she has done that now for years and years and years. What motivates somebody to do such a thing? It has to be the love of God, doesn't it? You see, beloved, if it's not love, motivating us to do ministry, then we're disqualified from ministry. If it's not love, then, then in the eyes of God, it's not ministry. Now that's a tough one to swallow. Because a lot of people do a lot of things, and I've shared this before in the past, and, and one of the things that, that has been one of the great challenges in my life has been one of the greatest enemies I have in ministry is my own energy. Because you know what? I can go do stuff, man. I can, get, I can do this and this and hustle. I got a lot of energy to do stuff. But you know what? In the eyes of God, that energy doesn't amount to anything if it's not motivated by love. If it's not motivated by love, it's just energy. If it's not motivated by love, it's just mind. So it has to be motivated by the love of God. Now, we've got to understand something. Don't you love Romans chapter 5? And this is, love of God is something that God does in our hearts. That God does in our lives. It's not something... People, you know, you, I, you teach along this way, and people say, well, praise God, I don't have that problem. I'm just a loving person. Let me inform you. You don't understand what I'm talking ah. about. You don't understand that point, John? I'm not talking about your natural temperament. I'm not talking about your personality. I'm not talking about your abilities. I'm talking about the love of God being on the inside of us. There's a difference. I'm talking about something that the Holy Spirit does on the inside of us. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. It says, and hope they that not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So it talks about there that the love of God 
pours his spirit and pours his love into our heart, pours his love on the inside of us. Only as we are receiving the love of God into our life and into our heart can we possibly be qualified to minister. Only the person who's doing it by love is going to be the person that can effectively minister for God. And then there's just no two other ways about it. You will fall out, burn out, whatever you do, you'll die out, you'll do something out if you don't aren't motivated by love. Because we, honestly, it's not that much fun to minister to people. I know we all think it's great, but there's far more times when we pay a price for ministering to people than we do receive some kind of great accolades. I mean, you know, I've ministered to a lot of people over the years, very few people applaud. And I can say, yeah, thank you. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of times God sends me to people to minister to people when they don't receive it. And I know it's God. And I know they need to hear it. But God decided to choose me to be the one to go give them something they don't want to hear. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is, you know, how I got that call, but that's part of ministry a lot of times. A lot of times we're sharing God's word with somebody who don't want to hear it. And, and so the only thing that would motivate you to do that would be love for that individual. Uh, we understand from Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, that love is what? It's fruit of the Holy Spirit. So love that I'm talking about is not your emotions, it's not your personality, it's not your disposition. <coughs> you are not naturally a loving person in this sense. The only way you can have this love that I'm talking about is if the Holy Spirit puts it on inside of you. We as human beings don't have that kind of love. It doesn't exist in us as beings. God is love. Love is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And he deposits it on the inside of us. And that's what Paul is praying for with the Ephesus, church in Ephesus there. That they would have that experience in all the fullness of God. And have that love poured into them. To where they have revelation of how much God loves them. But also so that that love takes charge of their life. And, and the thing that you understand, the Bible tells us that if we ask anything according to his will, then we can be confident that what we've asked has been heard. And if, we, and if what we ask has been heard, then it's been granted. So if we are truly sincere with God, and we go to God, and we ask him to deposit this kind of love on the inside of us, God will be faithful to do that. But we have to understand it's what we do in dependence and reliance upon the Holy Spirit doing it on the inside of us. The power that we get to minister to people and continue to minister to people is only can be the love of God on the inside of us. And if it's done with any other motivating force, then we are disqualified from ministry. Amen. Amen. That's what the Bible says, doesn't it? First, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's just walk through some of this stuff. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And there's a lot, you know, that's, you know, uh, it's easy to get wrapped up into doing things for God with other motivations. You know, we can be doing things for God because we're trying to earn things from God. You know, that's what man-made religion does. If I go out here and I do all these great things, then God's going to love me more. If I do all these great things, then I'm going to have a better place in heaven. Yeah. And, and a person can go out and do all those great things, and in the eyes of God, not have done a thing. That's what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, that word charity there is agape love, I have become as a sounding flash or a tinkling cymbal. Well, that doesn't sound good. No. You have to think we're doing great things for God, God says, you're just sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Mm -hmm. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity or agape love, I have nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to the burden and have not charity, it profited me nothing. So if the motivation is not love, then in the eyes of God, it doesn't amount to anything. So it's very important that we understand this. If we truly desire to do the works of Christ, if we truly desire to do the works that God would have us to do, the first thing we have to do is we have to go to God and make sure that we are a vessel full of his love. Yes. Amen? Amen? Okay, that gets all the shots for. Verse 4, because charity suffereth long. It doesn't give up on people. It doesn't stop ministry. It's kind. It envieth not. It's not looking at somebody else and thinking, well, I want to do what they do. It bought it not itself. It's not boasting about itself. It's not puffed up. 
doth not beheld David so unseemly, seeketh not her own, and is not easily provoked, and thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. So when we're looking at doing the works for God, the only hope we have of having the endurance we need to do it is we have to have the love of God on the inside of us. Yes. And that's one thing I've learned as a pastor. I watch many times, and you've heard me say this, that I watch many ministries, many people do things, and just, you know, fizzle out right away. <laughs> but it truly wasn't God in them doing it. It was something that they had an ambition, they had a desire, they wanted to be part of things, what have you. Some other thing motivated them, they meant well, but it wasn't the love of God producing it. And so it didn't hold up. And it didn't last long because the first time they realized, okay, this is a battle, then they wanted to, to give up. You see, everybody looks at things like, well, I'd love to do that. But we have to have the proper motivation. You with me so far? Yeah. Okay, like I said, we're jumping around. Matthew chapter 6. I'm just going to cover several different little things. So first step one, we have to have the love of God on the inside of us. And how we have the love of God on the inside of us it is a work of the Holy Spirit. Just simply asking, God, fill me up with your love. And he'll do it. Amen? Amen? And when you get frustrated with people, I have a red flag. I tell people this all the time. You've probably heard me say this before. I know I'll share it with Rachel several times. I have a red flag in my life. When I know I need to get in the presence of God and deal with the love issue is when I start getting frustrated with people. Mm -hmm. Because you know what? That tells me something. I'm doing this in the flesh now. Yeah. Love doesn't get frustrated. Mine gets frustrated. Amen. Love doesn't get frustrated. Amen. So when I start reaching that point, then I know I got to step back here. I got to find some time. I got to get along with God. I got to talk to God. God's got to deposit some love inside of me. Amen? Amen. And that's how I tell with myself. Matthew chapter 6. And these are just some real basic thoughts dealing with doing the works of God. This is something most of us know. Matthew chapter 6 covers what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, or visit our heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us for our sins as we forgive uh, our debtors. Or forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. Most of us heard that many times. Probably many have prayed that. But there's a phrase in there. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. Now, there's an aspect where we're praying for the kingdom of God, where we're looking for God, you know, Jesus to come back and set up his kingdom and his thousand year reign and, and, and do all that stuff. But there's also an aspect where we're looking for the kingdom of God to come right now. We're looking for a manifestation of God's kingdom right now, right here, today. Amen? Amen. How would God do that? You see, that becomes a big question. God, and you hear that preach all the time, well, yeah, God's kingdom can come right now. God, send your kingdom. Manifest your kingdom. How's he going to do that? You see, we have to understand how he's going to do that so we can be part of that and see that happen. So if we're going to see God's kingdom manifest right now, right here, in some capacity, and we do, and we can, and we can see more, we're going to see his kingdom manifest through his church. So if he's going to manifest his kingdom to his church, who's his church that he's going to manifest it to? That would be us, wouldn't it? In other words, we're praying, God, thy kingdom come. We have to be a vessel that's in place for God to manifest his kingdom through us. Yeah. Amen. Amen? Mm -hmm. You see, there's a time when Jesus, and an example I quite use this quite often, and prayed for a demon-possessed individual, Cast the demon out of them. They all the, the people standing by, the Pharisees in that group, were all saying, well, he's doing that by the power of Beelzebub, and so on and so forth. And you've heard me talk about this before. Jesus will to explain, no, even Satan is smarter than that. He knows that a house divided against itself so cannot stand. He says, but if I cast out demons by the power of the Holy Spirit, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So he tells us there that how the kingdom of God can be manifest in the day and hour we live is through a manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So when we pray and the anointing flows, the kingdom of God is being manifest, isn't it? We get in here and we worship and we begin to worship and the next thing you know, the Holy Spirit's beginning to move. The kingdom of God is being manifest. Somebody gets up here and begins to teach the word of God and the spirit of God begins to teach us and give us understanding and revelation. The kingdom of God is being manifest. In other words, the kingdom of God is going to manifest through vessels and we're the vessels. The same way that Jesus did that by the power of the Holy Spirit, doesn't the word of God say, out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water? So he's going to manifest through us. So if we're going to be people who are used to do the things of God, people who are used to do the works of Christ, we have to be people who are willing to be vessels and live our life in a way that the kingdom of God can manifest through us. Amen. You know, a lot of times we pray those prayers and we think, well, hope God sends somebody by. Hope God does something out here. When we're praying those prayers, beloved, we're asking God, manifest your kingdom through me. Manifest your kingdom through us. And one of the key elements is love, isn't it? Yes. So first of all, we have to have proper motivation. Our motivation has to be love. And we have to understand that God is looking to manifest his kingdom through us. You know, a lot of times in the Bible, we find examples where, where God did that through individuals. You know, one of the great examples was Elijah and the false prophets of Baal. You remember that where, where, where Elijah had the, the prophet showed out and he called up the false prophets and, and told them to call upon their God and if their God would come and consume the offering and they would worship him as a true God. And he said, but you know, and then I'm going to pray and if my God consumes the offering, then we'll know my God's a true God. So he laid down a challenge. Then they, you know, he let them go first and said, you guys go for it. You know, they went out there and they prayed for hours and they howled and they carried on and cut themselves up and did all kinds of crazy stuff, calling upon their false god to consume this offering. And, you know, Elijah, he was, you know, I, I kind of like Elijah, like I said, he's standing back and, you know, as a prophet trash-talking these people. You know, I suppose your god's asleep. Maybe your god's too tired to answer that. Maybe this or maybe that. Why don't you wake your god up? And after he's done with all that, finally he steps up, he, he soaks the, the offering down with water to make it really hard to consume it with fire. Says back, says, God, at your word I did this, and boom! Came the consuming fire and consumed the offering. Yeah, you see, there was a challenge in, a, in an encounter between two kingdoms right there. <coughs> between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, beloved. And God, when we're praying, God, thy kingdom come, we're asking God, God, use me as a vessel to have so we can see a victory won here on the behalf of the kingdom of God. Amen. We are praying, God, use me. Use me, God. Use me as a vessel. Use me as a, to, as a, as a, to, in this encounter. But we've got to be in a place to where we're a vessel that's willing to be used by God. We've got to be, like I shared this morning, we've got to be equipped. We've got to be equipped by God's Word. We've got to be equipped by God's Spirit. We've got to understand our place and our function. And we don't understand that we have a call in our life, each and every believer, to do these works and be equipped for the ministry, that we're never going to step into the call and the destiny that God has for our life. And what's going to happen, we're going to sit complacent as time goes by. Hallelujah. You know, I'm really just thinking, Hallelujah. We can't have things like that forgiveness in our life. You know, the Bible talks about that a lot. When Jesus did, uh, and in Mark chapter 11, he was talking, he, he had the fig tree incident, he told them they could do that. The very next thing he goes into is talking about unforgiveness. Now that's kind of an odd thing, isn't it? He stands there and says, well, you can, you can speak to this fig tree and it, 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 it obey you just like it did me. Have faith in God and you can do the same thing. Believe in your heart, speak with your mouth, and the same thing will come to pass. Well, by the way, but if you're afraid, have unforgiveness in your heart. There must be a real connection between God using us and unforgiveness. You see, apparently, if we have unforgiveness in our heart and we're not willing to deal with it, we're not a vessel for the kingdom to flow through. And that's why that's one of the things you hear me talk about quite often, bring up quite often, because that's such an important thing, beloved, 
in the, in the kingdom of God is that we don't have unforgiveness in our heart. Because that destroys unity. That destroys love. How can love flow through an unforgiving vessel? It's not going to work, is it? If we, you know, it, it, it's really, I don't know if I should go there. It's really unique how God has used me in life. And if you understood my past life, you would understand how unique it is. I mean, since the day I was saved, I have probably ministered more to people who had bondages and alcohol and drugs than any one type of person I've ever ministered to. I mean, a big part of my ministry has dealt with those issues. And God just puts me across their paths, and God has me minister to those type of people. Amen. Now, the reason that's so unique is, is, is out of my past lifestyle, I absolutely hated alcohol. I hated drugs. And I didn't want to, even though I was a drunk and a drug addict, I didn't want to be around any other drunks and drug addicts. <laughs> I'm serious, I couldn't stand it. Yeah. <laughs> I could not stand it. And my heart was so hard that if somebody was in that place in life, and, I, and I'm just speaking like the old man, even though I was there, and I know that's crazy, but those of you who've been here understand that, you know, you can be the worst drunk in town, but if you're not drunk, you don't want to be around drunks. Yeah. Right. And, you know, you can be the worst drug addict in town, but if you're not high, you don't want to be around drugs. Yeah, right. It's the dumbest thing in the world. But I was so hard-hearted toward people like that, that I wanted nothing to do with it. I mean, in all honesty, if somebody was a, a drug addict or an alcoholic, I wanted nothing to do with it. <laughs> out, out of here. Just very hard-hearted because of the wounds of my past life. And then I got saved. And I got delivered, and then God started everywhere I go, and I started ministering every church I go, please, drug addicts come in. <laughs> and I really had to deal with that. <laughs> God has a way of having you cross paths with what you're not right with. That's right. I thought I saw that was ruthless, but God can do that. <laughs> but it's odd. Things that you have a hard heart toward quite often is key to your ministry. So you think about who you can't forgive. Do you think about who you're hard-hearted to? You probably have a call in your life to minister to. Peter had a problem with Gentiles. God had to just flat out put Peter in a trance and deal with his heart so he would go and minister to Gentiles. Guess what, Peter? That attitude in your heart, you're getting ready to go preach to. So our heart is very important, beloved. You know why that is? Because quite honestly, the enemy is going to attack us in that area of our call. He's going to attack us in that area of our purpose. He's going to attack us in that area of our destiny. Because he wants to stop it from coming to pass. Now this is related to something else. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. Ain't this all just encouraging? Yes. Oh, <laughs> challenging, but encouraging. Challenging, but encouraging. This, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, when it comes to, to, to maturing in the things of God, ministering for the things of God, is probably some of the most basic but important scriptures that we can possibly understand. And I'm going to share a couple things with you along my line. And uh, it's my tonight to share stuff, I guess. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove <coughs> this, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do I prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? By being transformed by the renewing of my mind. Okay, when we're talking about renewing the mind, I want us to understand something. We're talking about God's Word and God's Spirit transforming us in the very depths of our being. We're not talking about, well, yeah, I know that. We're talking about becoming that. You see the difference? I, 
can know something in my head. I can have a thought. That don't mean that I've been renewed, that I've been transformed on the inside and become something different. See the difference? And, and I'll share you some examples of that. Uh, I can share about you a little bit. When I first came to Christ, there were some areas that I needed some really drastic changing in the depth of my being. There were some things that were deeply, deeply ingrained into me that I hadn't seen change if I was going to serve God and do what God called me to do. Yeah. Let me give you a story. I don't know if you were talking about this. Maybe it was the other day. I don't remember. Maybe it was today. I have an example in my mind that I still carry with me. But yet it was something that was deeply, deeply ingrained in me. And I call it my heroin game. And I would do heroin and try to imagine something that mattered to me. And I didn't ever think of anything. I said, well, somebody came in and just cut my right arm off. Who cares? What if somebody killed everybody I love? Who cares? What if somebody did this? Or what if this happened to me? Or what if that happened to me? Because that drug just bent me so much that nothing mattered to me, and I felt no pain. Now, that sounds like a goofy little story, and you think, what a goofy guy that would do a drug and sit and play that mental game with himself. But you see, there was something inside of me that I knew something. That in my mind, in my being, drugs were directly connected to killing the pain of life. So, and I'm not talking about just a thought in my head. I'm talking about something that was deep down inside of me that had been placed in me as part of my life from the time that I was a baby until the time I grew up. If, if I felt bad, my parents gave me alcohol to make me feel better. When I was a little kid, I get a cold when they take the pepper and snobs. All my life, I got toothache. I had bad teeth when I was young. I get a toothache. My dad's solution was take a shot of whiskey and hold my bad tooth. All my life, it was deeply, deeply ingrained to me that drugs and alcohol is what you do to deal with pain. So I got older, I started doing that, and I found out that I could take pain away. <coughs> so to speak, for a couple hours. <coughs> but drugs. Now keep in mind, this is deep, deep, deep inside of me. So then I get born again, I get up off the floor, I'm saved, new creation in Christ Jesus, praise the Lord, but there's still something deep, deep inside of me. Yeah. Yeah. And you see, as a believer, I had to have that dealt with at such a depth that now when I feel pain, I have an instantaneous response. I run to the presence of God. Yeah. Why? Because I, I'm not just talking about a thought in my head. But I'm talking about a victory that was won. I'm talking about something that was transformed on the inside of me by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God that tells me right now, when I'm in a hard place, when I'm in a battle, I need to run to the presence of God. Yes. And it never occurs to me to run to drugs. That's good. Where for a long time it did. For a long time I fought that battle. For a long time when I would be going through something in life, I would remember that stupid heroin. I could go kill the pain. You see, when I'm talking about being transformed by the renewing of our mind, I'm talking about being so totally rewired that we respond to life with the word of God and not with the ways of the world. You know, I always wonder when the Bible talks about how we're supposed to meditate on the word day and night. I thought, well, how do we do that? I mean, really, how do you meditate on the word day and night? Psalm chapter... Psalm 1, number 1 tells us, you know, that we'll see all this fruit if we meditate on the word day and night. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 tells us we'll see victory and good success if we meditate on the word day and night. How do you meditate on the word day and night? I mean, never do anything else but meditate on the word. And it really dawned me what it's talking about there. You see, when that word's in my heart in such a, uh, such a, a way, that everything I encounter in my life, my first response is, what does God's word say? That I'm meditating on a day and night. Every situation, every circumstance I run across, the first thing to rise up should be the Word of God. 
What does God's word say about this situation? That's why Jesus, when the enemy came against him, was able to say, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. That's meditating on the word day and night. Constantly, as I encounter life, what does the word say? What does the word say? Why? Because I've been transformed by the renewing of the mind. I want to get to such a degree where my mind's been renewed by the word that I don't think the ways of death at all anymore. I don't think the ways of this world at all anymore. Everything I encounter automatically, the word of God comes up inside of me and rises up, and, and the word of God is instantly in the front. Amen. That's what I'm talking about, where the spirit of God and the word of God transforms our very being to such a degree that we are changed. You see, back in the early days, and I was fighting those battles, I understood that that wasn't the right way of thinking. But I still thought that way. So I still had to cast down imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the high knowledge of Christ Jesus. But I still thought that way. My mind wasn't renewed. It was starting to get renewed. But when my mind is renewed is when I don't think that way anymore. I think the word. It's not like, well, I know I think that way, but I know that. Like, no, I don't think that way no more. Does that mean the enemy don't knock on your door? I tell the stupid story and I still laugh at it. I, I like to, to, to laugh at the devil sometimes. There was a time, this is a few years ago, and I'm driving by myself. And instantly I hear this voice saying, I'm going to drive past a chat, right? And I hear the enemy say, Boy, what the beer tastes good. And I just laughed. Why? Well, for one thing, I never did like beer. Right. You know, I mean, yeah. well, you know. <laughs> I never, you know, what they care for. But I mean, he just threw that little fire dart out there. Just throw that little fire dart out there. But we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind to such a degree. That's not me no more. I don't think that way. It's ridiculous. It's laughable. Yeah. Amen. See, that's what it's talking about with our mind being renewed. It's talking about us changed in the very depths of our being to where we don't cast down the thoughts. We don't think that way anymore. See, beloved, that's where we get into trouble is we think so often that it's just, well, I have heard that scripture before, so I know that. Don't know that mean that. If I abide in you and my word abides in me, and the word abides in me, part of me, it lives in me, and dwells in me. Then I will ask what I will, and it shall be done. Now, let's look at this in another way. Here's where we're talking about ministering to people. One of the things that has to happen is we have to be transformed in how we see people. Just like the way I saw drug addicts and alcoholics wasn't good. I had to be transformed in the way I perceived them so I could see them like Jesus sees them. To minister to them. And if I look at somebody, and, and, there, and come, there have been areas in my life where I've had to fight this battle. And one of the things that the Lord has really had to show me, and I had a certain way of thinking when it came to helping people. And it just came from the way I lived my life. And you weren't going to con me. And you weren't going to scam me. And I wasn't nobody's job. And so you come to me and you ask for help. I don't, let me see how you talk to you when I want to get out of trouble. Let me see, well, you deserve help. Let me see how you got yourself in this mess. Can I share something with you? Nobody ever got in a mess because they make good choices. Okay. So if you're looking, if I'm looking for somebody, I think, well, I don't know if you deserve help. I mean, you brought that on yourself. Well, everybody who's in a mess brought it on himself. Everybody who's in a mess made bad choices. Everybody who comes to you for help is there because they did something dumb. Amen? Everybody looking at me now like funny. That, that's just life. And none of us are, you know, none of us are free from that. We've all made those bad choices. We've all done dumb things. And we've all been in messes, haven't we? You see, that was the way I had of thinking. That had to change. And one day I was, I was just, you know, going about my business and, and not really praying, not talking to the Lord. 
and a situation had come up and somebody had asked to help for church and, and, and I had to deal with it. I'd pray, okay, well, I'll pray about that and I'll see if the Lord would help me to help you. And in my mind, I'm going through all this stuff and thinking about all this stuff and, you know, is this legit? Is this a real need? Blah, blah, blah. I've got all my ways of thinking about it. And the Lord just stopped me. I had to deal with helping somebody with finances. And, and the Lord stopped me. He says, when did I ask you to qualify the poor? He says, I told you to give to the poor. I didn't ask you to interview them first. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Latina. You see, God didn't put me in charge of determining who needs help and don't need help. And he began to talk to me and speak to me and like, yeah, that's true. But beloved, you know, it sounds funny to hear me tell the story, but I bet some of us have thought that way. Well, let's just see. I don't know. Do you deserve help? Let me tell you what. Look what you did, and I told you when you did this, you was going to end up here. Now you did this, now you ended up here, now you asked for my help. Did God ever tell you to do that? No. Or did he tell you to help me? You know, I've always thought, and since the Lord had been taking me through that process, and I said, okay, Lord, here's the deal. From this day on, when somebody asks me for help, I will say yes, unless you tell me no, Lord. See, it was just the opposite before. I'd say no, and it's got to be yes. <laughs> now, it's automatically yes, unless God tells me no. And there have been a couple times he told me no. But it's not our job to qualify who we minister to. It's not our job to take an application. You know, and I'm sure that that's what happened with the, we know the girl with the Good Samaritan. <coughs> the guy got robbed and left for, you know, left for dead along the highway. And the Levite just walked right past him. I'm sure the Levite probably didn't think he qualified. But if he went down <coughs> in his neighborhood, that wouldn't happen to him, would it? He probably drunk when he got robbed anyway. That's why you should be down in this neighborhood and drunk and didn't carry money. How dumb can he be? And then the priest probably walked by and said, yeah, we can get out here. I told him before. I've taught him about this. I told him about carrying money down here. I told him what would happen. The Samaritan came by and just seen me. And ministered to me. You see, God never put us in charge of deciding who gets ministered to him. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <coughs> we don't qualify. He never said that. He did it. Give to the poor unless they got in that situation because of their own doings. Unless they got in that position because of bad choices. He didn't say that. He said, give to the poor. Sometimes I wish he loved you. You see, I, I talked earlier about William Booth. That was the great battle that William Booth fought. That was the reason he was ridiculed and criticized by the body of Christ. Because he didn't qualify the poor. He just gave to him and helped And And some people said, well, you're wasting your money. Well, God told me to give me more. Right. God didn't tell me to qualify. I'm going to see who I should invest, what poor person I should invest in, what one I should. But you see, that's a renewing of the mind. And a lot of people who have come out of certain backgrounds we're quick, to, we're quick to make decisions about who we help and who we don't. Because we ain't going to take advantage of me. You're not going to count on me. You're not counting me. I'm just doing what God told me. I'm treating you in the Lord. Amen? Yeah. We've got to renew our minds to these things. We've got to be transformed by God's Word. We've got to understand who we are in Christ. We've got to understand the authority we have. We've got to have the mind of Christ and see people through the eyes of Christ and be moved with compassion if we're truly going to minister to people. Amen? Let me see something else here. Oh. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. Whew. Warm in here today, ain't it? And here, this is important too. It's all God's words important. And these are just key elements. We've got to do it by the love of God. Amen? We've got to understand God's looking to manifest His kingdom through us. We've got to have a mind to 
is renewed after the word of God. Or we're not going to be equipped to minister. And, and not just having the word of God memorized, but truly have been transformed by the word of God. That we're new people. And, and that's a lifelong process. James chapter 4. What was the old saying? Jesus was the word. He became flesh. Where flesh becomes the word. We're not actually supposed to have that transform us. James chapter 4 will say. The other key element is, and it's just a kind of a quick thought, is the presence of God. If we're going to go forth and minister for God, we have to come from the presence of God. And, and that's one of the most important things we have to understand, is we have to give place in our life to being in the presence of God. And James chapter 4, verse 8, says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So apparently that's part of drawing nigh to God. Draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. And, you know, we need to live that as a lifestyle. That as a lifestyle, we're drawing in the presence of God. Looking to live in the presence of God. And that means we've got to repent of things, we repent of things. If that means we have to lay things down, we lay things down. If that means we have to take a greater step, a greater consecration, that involves a greater consecration. If you notice, all the things I'm talking about tonight really do take effort. It really does take consecration. To be transformed by the renewing of our mind is a process of, of saturating ourselves with the Word of God. It's a process of saturating ourselves in the presence of God. You know, and it's not just going to church on occasion. It's not just going to church periodically. It's a lifestyle that we are consecrated to to, to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. And, and that's why sometimes it's a lot easier just to, you know, do a very casual church service and we come in and we sing a few songs and we preach a 20-minute sermon and we go home and, and, and that's what we do for God. But truly to do what God's Word is telling us to do with me involves a very, very deep consecration to commitment. And, and that involves drawing nigh to God, drawing close to Him, seeking to live in the presence of God. Psalm 22, 3. And I'm just going to go through a couple of these quickly. Hallelujah. You with me so far? Yes. Hallelujah. Psalm 22, 3. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our praises. God inhabits our praises. So as we draw nigh to God, and He draws nigh to us, one of the key ways that we can do that is through praise. One of the key ways we can do that is through worship. You know, I understand that in actual, in the Hebrew language way, I understand just that we're saying that God is enthroned by our praise. In other words, when we begin to praise God, it's like we build a throne here and welcome God to come and sit on that throne. That's what praise and worship does. It invites him. It gives him a seat. It gives him a throne. We begin to praise and worship. It invites the presence of God into this place. It invites the presence of God into our life. And beloved, that's one thing we need to be very aware of. We need to be walking in the manifest presence of God. If we're truly to do what God has called us to do and be what God's called us to be. And one of the key areas, one of the key ways we do that is through praise and worship. It should be a major part of our life. Not just in our church service, but in our life. We should praise God and worship God. It should be to the place to where praise and worship is a normal, natural thing. People say, well, I don't know if i got to go out in the closet and praise Him. Well, you should praise Him throughout the day. You should worship Him throughout the day. You know, it's like my kids, you say, I'd walk through the house and I'd be singing. And I, you know, my kids, you say, Dad, will you please be quiet? Stop singing! You know, and I say, I'm not singing and praising God. Well, can't you praise Him in your head? You know? Well, I guess it could. It doesn't seem to be as effective, does it? But it should be just a natural flow of our life to live in praise and worship of God, to live in the presence of God. Psalm 100, let's look at that real quick. Because the things we're seeking from God, the things we're desiring, Come from the Word of God, comes from the presence of God. Amen? Mm -hmm. I know it's easier just to tell funny stories and go. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. 
Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made it, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Verse 4, enter into his gates, how? With thanksgiving. Into his courts, how? With praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, and his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. So we enter into his presence with our praise. We enter into his presence with our worship. And let me show you one other thing. Psalm 67. I haven't done this for a long time. This kind of popped up in my spirit here. i got to find it again. Psalm 67. I, I, I used to teach this when I taught a lot about praise and worship. And I don't do that so much anymore. But uh, Psalm 67, I always called it the and then principle. And uh, if you'll notice here, you'll see why I call it the and then principle. Look at verse 5. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. The next word at the beginning of the next verse is what? Then. So it's saying here when we praise God, something is then going to happen. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. So when we praise him, then something happens. Fruit comes forth. When we praise him, then something happens. Increase comes forth as we step into his presence. And what I'm really sharing with you tonight is just some little nuggets out there of what I was talking about, about being equipped to do the works of the ministry, being equipped to the works of the Christ. It's all a lifestyle. It's all a lifestyle that God is calling us to. He's calling us to a lifestyle of prayer. He's calling us to a lifestyle of worship. He's calling us to a lifestyle of being transformed by the renewing of our mind, by the word of God. He's calling us to a lifestyle of manifesting his kingdom upon this planet. That's why the church is here. That's the call for each and every one of us. Imagine if you take a church of people and they truly consecrate themselves to that. And they truly begin to walk that out and live that. Imagine the power that would be manifest. Imagine the impact that would take place. Amen? But we've all got to understand we have this walk. We have this call upon our life to, to saturate ourselves with the word of God. To live in his presence. To live in praise and worship. To be a people of prayer, to be a vessel where the kingdom of God is manifest through our life. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And one of the great side effects of, of, of being in the presence of God is the joy of the Lord. And the presence of God is the fullness of joy. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's all just take a moment.